Hi, everyone. My name is Rui. My area of study is computational complexity and algorithmic randomness, and randomness in algorithms. I'm going to talk a bit uh, about some directions I'm interested in and I've been working on over the last couple of years. Wait, I was meant to introduce you. Well, okay. All right, so the plan would be first, I'm going to give a bit of a background about my area and the questions that I'm interested in. Then I'm going to formulate uh, one conjecture that motivates a lot of my research. And then I'm going to talk about new directions for the last several years that have been developing. So we're going to start with a prelude about cooking. So I know that everybody's hungry. So the first question that we're interested in is how to saute onions, which is a very important question. But we want to think about it as a computational problem, right? An algorithmic problem. So we're given as input chopped pieces of onion laid on a pan with a flame burning underneath. We want to apply a sequence of local algorithmic operations on the pieces of onion <laughs> to obtain the desired yummy output. <laughs> when we obtain an output, we can check and see that the onion looks well. It's good, it's well prepared, it's round. And when I try to do this at home, I do it just like everybody else. I flip the onion at random, right? And from my experience, it works. And of course, by any law of large numbers, <laughs> theoretically, it works. It's a great method of sauteing onion. So you look at this and you ask yourself the natural question, okay, can we do it in a deterministic, carefully planned way, have a careful deterministic plan of sauteing the onions? And the obvious answer is yes, of course we can. I mean, you give me an army of onion flippers, like a thousand people, each of them with a thermometer, they're going to flip each piece every 10 seconds, it's going to come out great. So this isn't an interesting question. The interesting question is how efficiently can we do it in a deterministic, carefully planned way? How much does it cost? <laughs> and of course, once we figure this out about onions, we generalize and ask, how can we do anything? Consider any computational problem that you can solve using random. <laughs> so this is a very general question, right? How much does it cost in terms of resources to do it in a carefully planned, deterministic way? And you think about it for like a minute, what comes out of this question is actually a classification problem. Because it's clear that for some problems, we must use randomness. Like to get cryptographic protocols that are secure, you need to use randomness. If you want to, to run in time that's sublinear in your input, your input is too large, you can't afford to read it, you must use randomness. But other problems are easy. I, I know how to add two numbers without randomness in a simple, <laughs> fast way. Right? We have lots of problems for which we have textbook algorithms that everybody knows that don't use randomness at all. So okay which problem belongs to which category, right? We have two different categories right now displayed. And more importantly, why? What are the properties inherent in a problem that make it either solvable deterministically and quickly or impossible to solve without randomness? And this is uh, an extremely general question, right? It's more than 50 years old. We don't expect to have a distinct answer anytime soon. In fact, it's one of the main questions in computational complexity in theoretical computer science. It's inherently related to all the other major questions. It has intimate ties to P versus NP, to circuit lower bounds, to lower bounds for Turing machines, learning theory, interactive proof systems. Basically, every major question in theoretical computer science is inherently related to the question of understanding and simulating randomness. And personally, I don't have a good explanation why. I mean, I can show you a sequence of theorems for each of those that connect this question to the area, to the relevant area, but I don't have an elevator pitch. Suppose P equals NP. Yeah, then of course you can do this. <laughs> <laughs> Some people believe it, don't they? Yeah, no, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> but in particular, if you want to prove uh, the opposite, that you can simulate randomness, you need to separate P from NP. Okay. okay. So the thing is, as I would say, I don't have a good elevator pitch for why it's so important. It's well known, it's one of the basic questions in every textbook, it's a major question, but there's no clear couple of sentences explanation that explain why, other than the fact that it's, in, it's inherently interesting. All right, so let's, let's define formally like a big conjecture. So we consider the class of computational problems whose solutions can be found efficiently using randomness, and verified efficiently using randomness. So you give me a solution, I can see that it's a good solution, I can test it. 
And without loss of generality in this context, it suffices to focus on functions with one output bit, just accept, reject. So we define the class BPP, bounded error probabilistic polynomial time, to be the class of Boolean functions from strings to single bit that can be solved by a probabilistic polynomial time Turing machine with some small error. So we have a probabilistic Turing machine, it runs quickly in polynomial time, and for every input, it's, it, it computes the function correctly, except with some small probability. And the conjecture originating in the 1970s is that this class actually equals P. So every problem that you can solve efficiently and verify the solution efficiently using randomness, you can do so without randomness at all. And this was raised about 50 years ago. And to tell you the truth, I have no idea why at the time. It was a long time ago. People, or as I've been told, I wasn't alive. As I've been told, people were very convinced of this. And they had this, so we had good reasons to believe it today, right? It's been a while. And the underlying intuition already at the time was that every probabilistic algorithm can be de-randomized if you try to be clever enough and think hard enough. Whichever probabilistic algorithm I can give you, you can eliminate the random choices. These are just like simple tricks you can work around. And in the night, we're going to do a bit of history now. This was the 70s. They raised this very bold and broad conjecture. And in the 1980s and 1990s, it was laid, it was laid on solid theoretical foundations. The first thing I'm going to talk here is about the modern definition of PRGs, pseudo random generators, which in this modern definition, these are algorithms that take a short random seed and stretch it to a long sequence of bits. So we get a, a seed of truly random bits and we stretch it to a long sequence. And the crux of it is that the output should look random to any efficient observer, not just to some subset of statistical tests, but also to, to tests that we've never thought of. Any possible efficient observer can distinguish it from truly random. And it allows us to replace random bits in every algorithm by pseudo random bits, right? Because the algorithm is efficient, it cannot distinguish, it cannot tell the difference by which we shrunk the number of truly random bits from long to, to short. Why is it helpful? Just, you know, as an example, think of generating n pseudo random bits, and if we can do so with a logarithmic number of bits, logarithmically short c, we can just enumerate at this point. It's so short, we can go over all the possible choices, and we're done. So a celebrated sequence of works in the 80s and the 90s that are taught in every complexity <laughs> textbooks um, brought forward the hardness versus randomness framework. So you start with hardness assumptions. From hardness assumptions, you construct this type of PRGs, and you deduce very strong de-randomization. Why do I say very strong? Well, not only did we de-randomize all possible algorithms in the world, we did so in what we think of as a black box manner. We have one PRG that's good for all algorithms. So just one example. And this example shows something additional in these results. We actually have characterizations for the existence of PRG in terms of hardness assumptions. So for example, the second line here, this is a, a, an efficient PRG with a stretch just like the one we just showed. And we know that its existence is equivalent to a natural hardness assumption. It's a function computable in exponential time that is hard for non-uniform circuits. This is some model of computation that, are, that have the size that is slightly less exponent in the exponent. With a natural hardness assumption, and it characterizes the existence of, of PRGs. This is great, it's a classical answer, and as a consequence of these PRGs, we have, for example, BPP equals P, the big conjecture we talked about. And following these works, a natural question that you ask yourself, and that has been introduced in the early 2000s, is whether we really need PRGs for randomization. Like I just said that this is a very strong way to do the randomization. You have one algorithm that's good, one randomization that's good for all algorithms, right? It's conjectural that it might be necessary because the lower bounds might just be true. But there's a long line of research in the last two decades. We have no conclusive answer yet. There's a large gap between what we know is sufficient and what we know is necessary. The gap isn't only quantitative, it's also qualitative. There's an issue here. We don't know the answer. <laughs> Which brings me to the last several years in which there has been fast-paced progress in this area. So I'm going to talk about two main directions. The first direction, replacing the classical hardness versus randomness framework with a new type of framework that allows you to it. The motivating question here is, okay, can we de-randomize without using PRGs? Is there another method? And the natural idea to do it is to tailor the pseudo-randomness to the specific algorithm. 
That's the first thing you will try to do, I give you an algorithm. You try to tailor pseudo randomness specifically to it. And what this requires us to do is to use information from the code of a Turing machine in a non-black box fashion, right? Look inside the machine to generate pseudo randomness for that machine. And this is kind of a, this type of thing is kind of a holy grail in complexity theory. These are typically challenging, these are typically interesting things where we can do it. And um, because the, the punchline here is that right, instead of like a one PRG that's good for all algorithms, you have for every algorithm a corresponding pseudo randomness. Just uh, instead of the previous picture, now the algorithm gets a short random seed, but also a description of the specific machine. And it generates a sequence of pseudo random bits that are good for that particular machine. And indeed, along with the co author Lydia Chen, we've been able to do it. In fact, introduce something much broader. It's like a new paradigm and a new technical framework to get this type of results in various settings. And we can tailor the pseudo randomness to a specific observer. In all settings, this relies on inherently weaker assumptions. This doesn't require the same circuit law balance that I just talked about. And it connects randomization to new questions in theoretical computer science. So it helps, it helps us better understand why it's central. I'm going to just mention uh, one result, which is with uh, Lei Chen from a couple of years ago. <laughs> so already a sequence of follow-ups. So it's a two-way connection between the statement BPP equals B, the conjecture, regardless of PRGs, and the relaxed hardness assumption that doesn't talk about circuit lower bounds, but also on, only talks about lower bounds for probabilistic Turing machines, which is the right thing to expect when you talk about the randomization. It's unclear why circuits should need to come up. So it's a two-way connection between, of course, a non-black box type of the randomization, just the one that I just showed, and new types of hardness assumptions that weren't studied before and apparently characterized the randomization. And the second direction of study, trying to push the efficiency of all of this to the limits. Because in these classical results that talk about all algorithms, they have lots of algorithms. If you take an algorithm, a probabilistic algorithm that runs in time t, and you try to simulate it, you get an algorithm that runs in time proportional to t, say two, t to the thousand, which theoretically is a good answer, but in practice, nobody's going to ever run an algorithm that runs in time t to the thousand, no matter what, right? And a couple of years ago, uh, Doron et al raised the question of, okay, how fast can we go? How fast can the randomization be? And it's a question about fine-grained polynomial time complexity, right? What's the exponent? Is it a thousand? Is it three? Is it two? Can we get one? Going back to the 70s, is it possible that randomness in this context is actually so useless that you can simulate it without paying for it at all, just for free? So the second direction I've been involved with is free lunch theorems in the randomization. And the ways to get it. You construct a free lunch randomization, which are algorithms that have no overhead whatsoever. And they have some mistakes, but you'll never notice. <laughs> because no efficient observer can find a mistake. So it's a lunch that looks free, and for all purposes, it is free. <laughs> <laughs> and this that says a big bill later. Right? Unless there's a big bill later. Big bill later, right? <laughs> well, at the moment, you haven't been able to notice it. Let's play the <laughs> so this type of free lunch theorems and their anonymization crucially rely on the new framework of non-black box techniques. You can't get it with the classical stuff. So just as a sample theorem, which is from another work with the same co-author, Li Chen. So under strong assumptions that I'm not going to outline, probabilistic time t is effectively in deterministic time t to the one plus epsilon where epsilon can be as small as you want. And this is for every algorithm that runs in time t, it holds also in the setting of explicit constructions, and do explicit constructions in the same time that it takes you to verify that the object is good. And effectively here, uh, yeah, if so it has no overhead and it looks correct, right? it's great. Effectively here, this is kind of a technical statement, I'm not sure I wanna go over, it means that no observer can find a place where the new deterministic algorithm disagrees with the original probabilistic one. This is the last slide. So just a couple of interesting directions I'm currently interested in and working on. So connections, we're trying to get some answer that will satisfy me as to why the randomization is so important in theoretical computer science. And the way to do it is to drive new connections between randomization and other questions. 
the new non-black box way allows us to get more and more connections to problems we still haven't understood or thought. A second direction is necessary and sufficient hypothesis to get these free lunch theorems. The current hypothesis are way too strong. They're plausible, but it's unclear that they're actually necessary. Uh, these uh, non-black box type of techniques allow to bypass several classical barriers. Surely there are more. It's a matter of exploring which areas they're applicable in. And this entire uh, paradigm of study naturally extends to randomization in other settings. For example, interactive proof systems, machines that use a limited amount of memory, machines that use in parallel and so on, that work in parallel, and so on and so forth, other classes. That's it. Thank you very much. The guarantees that you mentioned under hardness assumptions, yeah. how practical are they? In the sense of uh, how long does it, does it take them to work? Yeah, I, like, are they things that you could actually implement and use? But you start with something that I don't have my hands on, a hard function. So like, uh, it depends on the complexity of the hard function just to begin with, right? Uh, so hardness doesn't mean like uh, assume some problem is not in P. Um, hardness means assume that some problem is not solvable by a certain class that you can think of as analogous to P, but it's another computational model. Uh -huh. So it depends on the parameters there, how much you're losing already in that hardness assumption. If you push that hardness assumption to the max, then you apply the PRG construction and you ask, okay, how much overhead does this add to the hardness, to the, to the overhead that you get from the hard function itself? Originally, it was quite a large overhead, but in new works, we got it to be this one. You make a big deal about the exponents in t in the polynomial time, but you ignore the so your t to the one plus t to the one plus epsilon maybe uh, without. Do you know what the constant dependence on epsilon? Oh, maybe arbitrarily small. Epsilon is arbitrarily small. No, no, but the constant in front uh, it's bigger, right? Ah, yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> maybe that part is is the you know inverse argument from. True, but the epsilon would give that part to the I know problems with it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let's try Cronin again.